Got some technical difficulties, so Alex is going to be my remote today. And uh, we'll see if we can't get it lined out for next week. I wanted to ask you something, a couple of things, you know, <clears throat> about spiritual warfare. Um, you know, I have people that I listen to as well <clears throat> when, I'm, uh, when I need ministering to. And, and one of them is a fellow named Dean Braxton. I've talked about him in some of my presentations. And the reason why I listen to him is because um, he's got a testimony about having been with the Lord when he was, when he was dead. And he's got records of himself being dead, and I don't want to get into all that, except, except that um, he talks about some things that he experienced while he was gone. And what I do is I listen to what he said that, it, that he experienced, and then I go looking for it in the Bible. And that's what I do with that. And the reason why I value him as a minister is because... Uh, because all of us that come up through the denominations or churches of Christ, because they don't like to be called a denomination, wherever we come up through, every church builds boxes for God and expects them to operate. He, they expect God to operate within those boxes. And He doesn't operate within any of the boxes that we built for Him. And so I have these boxes myself that, uh, that I needed to uh, be delivered from. And the Lord, uh, once I set my heart on being delivered from those boxes, He began to help me with a lot of that. But every now and then, He'll say something, and, uh, and I'll want um, to go find out, okay, where's that at? Where's that in the Bible? Because if we can't find it in the Bible, we really can't even share it, can we? Yeah, we can't. And so, one of the things that He said recently, and it was just one of the presentations that He was given, He said that, <clears throat> that one of his boxes that was broken was spiritual warfare. And we're talking about angel wars. He saw angel wars when he was dead. And he said that the weapons that they used were not the ones that he thought they would be using. And he said that angels were sent to an area where they spoke the word of God against the forces of evil, the forces of evil or against demons and what they were doing. And that was their warfare. Now we know that the Bible speaks of angels having swords and bows and all that kind of thing. But, okay, where, where is the evidence that that is true in the Scriptures? Where, it, it, is, it is evident that it's true in the Scriptures. But I want to ask you all a question now. How many of you all have known someone that would come through the Scriptures whenever demonic forces were coming against them and they would quote them aloud against those forces? Raise your hand. Okay? I bet you've done that, haven't you? Somebody taught you to do that. And, you know, I knew that about you too. I, I had a witness about that. But your mother was one of them. Somebody taught them to do that. Where did that come from? See, it, it's not easy to see in the Scriptures, but it's in there. But someone taught them to do that. And so I believe the Holy Spirit is the one that taught that person to do that. Because there's nobody, nobody not any preacher saying this is what you can do. When you've got demonic forces coming against you or, or there's a place that's evil or something that's evil, that Scripture, that you could take the Word of God and that you could read it aloud against those forces and defeat those forces. And um, it seems to me some of that was part of the, the movie, War Room. Am I right? Was that was some of the... Okay, she did that in that movie, War Room. Okay, how did they... How do, how do people that are making movies know about that? Where'd they learn that? Okay, so... There is a, a work of God to get this information out in this day because this is the day that we need it more than anything, I think. Because, uh, you know, one of the things that Dean said about this time is, is that heaven is closing in upon this dark spot. Uh, the, the heaven, is, heaven is not a dark spot with a light in it. That's not what heaven is. Heaven is light because that's where God is. And this dark spot was created because of the angelic rebellion. And so whenever, whenever angels rebelled, darkness was created. And that's what caused our universe to be a dark spot. And the sun was created and put in this dark spot to give it light. So it's kind of like a, a, a life source to this darkness. But he, he, he created the earth within this rebellion, within this darkness, to redeem a part of it back to himself. And so... The rest, if you would imagine, for example, a sheet, a, a white sheet on the ground, and you just take an ink blot and put it on there. That's what we're talking about. 
This, that dink block would be our, our, where we live. We live where the demons live. And this darkness was created because of the rebellion. <clears throat> now, I want to start talking to you a little bit about where all this comes from. Let's let, go ahead and turn the slide for us, Bubba. Angel Wars. You know, this is the first place that I begin to think of. Well, not the very first, but it's one of the places. When Jude was talking about Mike the Archangel, now this is a revelation that Jude has given us. You know, we don't know about this, you know, unless Jude told us. He said there was a time that the devil was contending for the body of Moses. He, he wanted to do something. He wanted to get possession of the body of Moses and corrupt people with it, you know, make an idol out of it or whatever. And so what happened was Michael, an archangel, which is a chief angel, he comes in and what does he do? Does he strike the devil with his sword or shoot him with his bow? No, he said, he said words. The Lord rebuked thee. That's what he did. And so we actually see what Dean said that he saw taking place over the body of Moses. See? He come in and he spoke the Lord's rebuke toward him. And so also in Daniel... This doesn't explain what really what's going on, but it shows that there are angel, angel wards. And, and what we see is that um, this, this angel, uh, I believe we're talking about Gabriel here, he said, Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, from the, from the first day that thou didst set thy heart to understand. And that's what we got. We got to get to that place that Daniel was. We got to set our heart to understand something, and we have to chasten ourselves before, the, before our God. He says, from that day forward that he set his heart to do that, his words were being heard. And so, I mean, it's true. If you want God to hear you, get your heart right. And so he, he set his heart to understand something. He set his heart, to, he chastens himself before God. He wants, to, he wants to let the Holy Spirit bring him into alignment with God's ways and thoughts. And he says, I am come for thy words. But the prince of Persia, and, and you know, we're talking about demonic forces that were working in Persia. He says he withstood him 21 days. So he said there was a hang-up. That he, would, he had to go and deal with the, with, uh, the demonic for, uh, forces over the kingdom of Persia for 21 days. And it was, a, it was a job that required help. So Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help him. And he remained there with the kings of Persia. Michael came, to, Michael came and remained there with the kings of Persia while he came to Daniel. And so there was forces there that needed angels to come. And what I believe, he, he, he's not telling us what they were doing, but they were speaking the word towards that darkness that was on the move in Persia. And so he's come. Go ahead and turn the slide. Okay, and it says, so this is the next question I have. What if the weapons of spiritual warfare is, a, is the spoken word of God? Is there anything like that in the scriptures? Well, in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3, it says, For thou... For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. And you know, that's what we're getting down to. The, the, the weapons which are carnal, they're like swords and bows and things like that. He said, our bow, he said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So they're not bows and swords, but mighty through God. So see, our weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now strongholds are like those boxes we build. Or it may be some uh, place that the devil has found to work in your heart. And it's, it's a place that you're having trouble getting rid of. You opened up a door that you can't close. And so that, that is something that, that God will have to close. And you will have to, 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 uh, to go to His Word because that's where He's going to work through closing those or pulling down those strongholds. And so this is the kind of things that, he's, that we, we're seeing the weapons of our warfare can do. They can cast down imaginations. We're talking about things that you believe that aren't true. It can, and it can cast down every high thing that exalts itself against anything that's from God. See? And it can bring even into captivity thoughts. Your thoughts are getting away from you. Your thoughts are dwelling in places they ought not to be. See? On lust or murder or whatever. It can bring those thoughts into captivity. And even, in, even under obedience to Christ. And so he's talking about the weapons of our warfare and how mighty they are through God. And so we're just looking at what we've learned so far about what the spoken Word of God can do to deliver you from the, whatever stronghold or imagination or as he says here, uh, an ideal that's exalting itself against what is true, what's really from God. And you know, until we get to that place to chase in our hearts where we, it's, it's not easy, for, especially for preachers, to get that place where they'll say, God, whatever you show me, I'll believe it. Because most of them get fired for doing that. 
for saying anything that's outside the, the scope of the approval of those denominations. And so, um, next slide. All right. Warring a good warfare. You know, the, the Bible, the, the writers, they always talked about it in these terms. We see from Romans ten seventeen, Paul says that faith comes by hearing the message, and the message is what Christ spoke. And so first of all, if we're going to know what, we, what we're supposed to believe in in order to war a good warfare, it's whatever Jesus said. It's whatever Jesus or the Holy Spirit revealed through the apostles. Those, that's what we're supposed to believe in. Okay, so there's a standard or a record that's supposed to give us the faith of what we're supposed to believe. And so this is where it begins as we're, as we're studying how to war warfare. We're either going to turn to the record and we're, going to, we're either going to base what we believe upon that record or we're going to turn to all kinds of weaker and, and more sinister uh, uh, messages to fill our head full of things that will destroy this faith. And so we, we've, got a, we, we've got things that are not true competing with what the record says. And so what we have to do, first of all, to war a warfare, if we want to go to war with what's going on with the demonic forces coming against us, the first thing we have to do is eliminate all the records but God's. We've got to eliminate all the information we're looking at but God's record. If you want to get your heart to a place where you can war a good warfare, then that's what you've got to do. You've got to eliminate the other influences. And listen, it, it's not, it's, it starts with, like we said the last time that, that I spoke, every time you have a trial, the first one that's going to come to see you is the devil. He's going to try to tell you all the reasons why you're having that, and all of that is lies. Why all this is going on in your life, it's all lies. But people generally get hung up on those lies. The very first son and daughter God created, Adam and Eve, they went for the lie. And so it is today that people still go for the lie. They say it's God's fault. God don't love me. God, called, God allowed this. Well, look, the devil's come to steal, kill, and destroy. And what God is doing is delivering you from all the messes you get yourself into. Because you give the devil a place to work. That's how he gets in there and starts to work. Somebody gave him a place to work. Say, and they, they were used either to harm themselves or others. And so, first thing we've got to do is put the record before us and believe the record and eliminate the, the, com the competing information. Get out of that competing information and get in the record. And so whenever, when, when Paul was talking to Timothy, he said, I charge, this charge I, this charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which were before on thee, that thou mightest war good warfare. So he knew that Timothy was chosen for a particular work. He knew about that stuff, that there was prophecies about the work he would be doing. And so he said, war good warfare. So the language is there that we're, we're at war with the demonic Satan and his minions. That's what we're at war with. And so this is the way, the, the, this is the way we begin that warfare, holding faith. You believe what the record says. If you're not going to turn to the record and hold to what the record says, you've lost the war before you've begun. And that's just all there is to it. You have to go to the record. You have to war based upon what the record says. You have to hold faith in a good conscience with some, with some, he says, having put away. They put away the faith in the record, and therefore their faith was a shipwreck. If you want to know how to have a shipwreck, it's to stop paying attention to the record and start paying attention to something else. Okay, that's how you have a shipwreck. And so if you're going to war a warfare, if you're going to engage in war a good warfare, you have to put the record before you eliminate the competing information. Go ahead and click it. Jesus in battle. Now this is one of the things that I noticed. Is one, this is actually one of the first things that I thought about uh, whenever I heard him say that this is, these are the weapons of the angels' warfare. Let's go ahead, next slide. Uh, when Jesus was tried by the devil, what did he do? He spoke the word to him. I mean, that is so obvious. He didn't strike him with a sword. He didn't shoot him with an arrow. He quoted the scriptures to him. And that's all that that woman was doing on war run. See? She's, she's quoting the scriptures and she's claiming those as truth. She's, she's professing her faith in those things to defeat those forces that have come against her and whoever she's trying to help. And so, um, 
In Luke 4, verse 1, it says, Jesus, see, He was guided by the Holy Spirit into the wasteland or the wilderness. So the Holy Spirit's leading Him to a place to be tested by the evil one. And so that's where He went. He hadn't eaten anything, and the evil one comes to Him, and He says, if you're the Son of God, give orders that this stone become bread. And so Jesus made answer and said, it is, it is said in the writings or in the Scriptures, bread is not man's only need. And so there was a need for Jesus to be fasting to be able to meet his enemy and, and to succeed over him. And so he took him up and let him, <coughs> let him see all the kingdoms of the earth in a minute of time. Now this is another thing that came to my mind. Can the devil perform a miracle? I don't know. Maybe he can. That kind of looks like one. See, maybe he showed Jesus something in a vision. I don't know. It's something to consider. Because of the verse that says, try the spirits that may be in someone to see if they're a spirit of God or not. And so he took him up and he showed him in a minute of time. And the evil one said, I will give you authority over all these and the glory of them because it's been given to me and, and I will give it to anyone at my pleasure. Next slide. If then you will give worship to me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said in the writings. Again, he quotes the scriptures. Give worship to the Lord your God and be his servant only. And he took him to Jerusalem and he put him at the high point of the temple and said to him, If you be the Son of God, let yourself go down from here, for it is written, He will give his angels orders to care, to care of you. And in their hands shall he keep you up so that your foot may not be crushed against a stone. And so now the devil has changed his tactics. He's quoting scripture at Jesus to try to get him to do something. And Jesus answered and said, and so he was misusing this scripture. Then Jesus said, it, it is written, and it was written in the scriptures, you may not put the Lord your God to a test. And that's what that would be doing, putting the Lord his God to a test. And so and when all these tests were ended, the evil one went his way from him for a time. Now we know the next time that they faced each other off was at the cross. Okay? But he went his way for a time. And Jesus came back to Galilee and the power of the Spirit and the news of him went through all the country round about. Next. Okay, I want to point out about what the Scripture says about Jesus' return. Now we know these things, but let's just start looking at it from the standpoint of Jesus speaking the word and his word having power, we are told that the world was spoken to existence. So he spoke it and it was. And so that's the kind of power the word of God has. And so it says um, in verse 11, Revelation 19, that John saw heaven standing open and there was a white horse and its rider was named Faithful and True. With integrity he judges and wages war. So he's coming for war. We know this is at the end of the age. The, the, the rider appears with all of his heavenly army, and he's coming for war. His eyes are a flame of fire. On his head are many crowns, showing he's the king of kings. And on his name written, and he has a name written on him, but only he knows. And he tells us what that name is. It's the word of God. And so here he has this name, which is the word of God. And the army of the heavens were, were wearing white linen, following him on white horses. But then it says a sharp sword comes out of his mouth to defeat the nations. Now we know the, the sword is the word of God. Nobody cares a sword for killing people in their mouth. This is the word of God that's proceeding out of his mouth. And so what it says of him is that the rider on the horse killed the rest, the, the rest with the sword that came out of his mouth. So we're saying that at his spoken word, his enemies fall dead. Okay, And so that's what it's saying, that these people died by the spoken word that proceeded out of his mouth. And the birds actually gorged themselves on the flesh of those that were killed. So just like Jesus can speak life into the world, he can speak death upon his enemies. You know, and it's just like that fig tree, that fig tree, he spoke, he spoke and cursed it. And it knew who he was and it died. Say, it had to do what he said. So it died. And so that's what we're talking about, the spoken word of the Lord. See, that, it's, that, it is the, that it is the weapon of his warfare. Next slide. 
So Jesus waging war again in chapter 2. So he says, so, so return to me and change the way you think and act, or I will come to you quickly and wage war against them, talking about those that were, that were corrupt, wage war against them with the sword of my mouth, the sword from my mouth. So again, that is the weapons of his warfare. And so in Hebrews chapter 1, it's speaking of God, it says in these last days he spoke to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he's also made the world. So here's, here's the, the, the Son of God, by whom God made the worlds. And it says, who being in the brightness of God's glory, and the express image of God's person, and upholding all things by the word of his power. Now listen, when, when, God, when, when the Lord spoke the world into existence, it continues to be held together by the word of his power. That's what he's saying. Everything that we, that we see and hear that's continuing to function to keep us a habitable place to live, it's all, up, it's all being upheld by the word of his power. And see, we, we would think in terms of, oh, he's got his hands around it holding it together. No. It's just his spoken word that causes it to be upheld. See? Uh, and so he speaks there of uh, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Next slide. So our victory in Christ over the principalities. Now, you know, it's funny. He's, we're going to pick that where we up where we just finished reading. That when he's talking about the circumcision of Christ, he says this happened when you were placed in the tomb with Christ through baptism. In baptism, you were also brought back to life with Christ through faith in the power of God who brought him back to life. So he's given us a message that in baptism we become new and by our faith in God's power, we, we are brought back from, 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 a, from being dead to being alive. He says you were once dead of your, because of your failures and your uncircumcised corrupt nature, but God made you alive with Christ when he forgave you of all your failures, which he said he did that because your faith in his, in his word that he would remove it when you were baptized. So he says he did this by erasing all the charges that were brought against us by the written laws that God had established. He took all those charges away and nailed them to the cross. When he got nailed to the cross, that was payment for those charges. And so what he's saying that when he did all these things upon the cross, he said he stripped the rulers and authorities. We're talking about the demonic forces. He stripped the rulers and authorities of their power. And he made a public spectacle of them as he celebrated his victory in Christ. So we're just saying that when Jesus died upon the cross and arose from the dead, he spoiled all of their powers. Because they needed you to be guilty to be condemned with them. And now if you come to Jesus to be cleansed, they can't accuse you of anything. You overcome them by the blood of the Lamb. And so that's what he means by he stripped them of their power by dying upon the cross. So this is the spoken word to us about our salvation. If we believe, if we have faith in God's power to take away our sins because of what Jesus did, the enemy can't touch us. Okay? Next slide. Now, when Jesus speaks, you know, when Jesus came into the world, you know, He came down to Cap, uh, Capernaum or Caponium, uh, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at His doctrine because... For His word was power. See, they knew when He spoke, it had power. And they were actually seeing His power uh, affect those that were sick. If He spoke them for them to be healed, they were healed. If he, if he spoke and told demons to leave, they left. So His word had power. And in the synagogue there was a man which had a spirit of unclean devil, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What have we have to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, thy Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him and said, Hold thy peace, in other words, be quiet, and come out of him. And when the devil had thrown him in the midst, he came out of him, and he didn't hurt him. And they were all amazed and spake among themselves, saying, What a word is this? For with authority and power he commanded the unclean spirits, and they came out. So we're just showing how that His Word has power. And it's not just to speak for a demon to leave. It's all of the things that He said and gave us. We can do the same thing. We can take His words and we can claim those. We can uphold those against the forces working against us. And we can defeat them. Next slide. 
Christians in battle. Next slide. So the Lord teaches us to wage war, doesn't He? I mean, when we start to look at scriptures from this perspective, what does it say? As for God, Psalms 18 verse 30, As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust Him. And so what, I, what he's saying is when you speak the word of the Lord, the Lord is the buckler or the sword wielder behind what you just spoke. And so he is saying that this is a tried and true word and he is going to be the wielder of that sword behind the words that is spoken. And so for who is God, for, for who is God save the Lord? Or who is a rock save our God? Now listen to what he says. It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. And so he's showing that God is the power behind the word. He's the one that gives us strength and makes our way perfect, as he says. And he says, He maketh my feet like hinds feet and settleth upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to war. Now this is what we're talking about. That the Lord teaches us to war. And this is spiritual warfare particularly that we're interested in. He teaches us to war. So that a bow of steel is broken by my arms, thou hast also given me a shield of thy salvation. So we're talking about how he's going to shield us and, and, and by our knowledge of his salvation, saving us not only from our sins, but from everything. That's what he does. That's what he's famous for is his deliverance. And thy right hand hath holden me up. Again, it is His right hand that, that holds us up from day to day as we go through what we go through. And, his, and thy, thy gentleness hath made me great. And so He's very, very kind. He's very, very patient with us. And He's, uh, he's, he's always there to gently lead us back to a better place. Next slide. The fallen angels and principalities against us. In Romans 8, verse 37 to 39, it's there wherever we look in the Scriptures. In 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. So we're, we're just talking about defeating the enemy, being a conqueror of, of those demonic forces, those powers, these, these fallen angels and principalities that he speaks of. He says, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor this, fallen angels, or principalities, or powers, or things present or things to come, nor height nor death, or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we want to be in a relationship with the Lord, they can't do anything about it. All they can do is lie and deceive so that you leave yourself. But they can have no power to separate you. Next slide. The weapons of our warfare. In Ephesians uh, chapter 6, it says, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. What he wants you to know <coughs> is because you belong to him, the devil is coming against you. And his wiles are all of his clever ways of getting you to fall. And so he's saying you need to be armed up, okay, against the wiles of the devil. He says he wants you to know because we're not wrestling against a human army but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness, the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what we're at war with. And so he says, because of that, you need to take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Now that's the day that you're tested and tried, or the day they come against you, and having done everything possible to be able to stand against those forces. And so this is what he says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. Now listen, it all goes back to this simple ideal. If you're going to go to war with the principalities and powers in dark places, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to gird yourself with truth. And the only place you can get that from the record. Everything you get outside of the record is going to be against you. But whatever you get from the record is going to be for you. So we need to go to the record to, to, for our information. And then he says, having the breastplate of righteousness. Next slide. And, you know, we might say about that last breastplate, in the New Testament, our righteousness is imputed because of our faith. You need to know that. Okay, we, we, a knowledge of our righteousness coming from God is very important because you, you never feel righteous enough to deserve anything. Okay, having said that, in verse 15, it says, Have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So he's saying be productive while you're going through your trials, while you're under attack, be productive. He says, above all, taking the shield of faith. Now this is important because your shield against everything the devil says is what? 
Your faith in what God has already said. See, faith, faith comes by hearing the message, and the message is what Christ spoke. There is no other thing to have faith in. There is not anything else. And so we have to have a shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. If you're not going to believe what God has said in His record, you have no protection from the darts. And so you're going to take the darts all day long. All day. Day after day after day. You're getting sunk with fiery darts because you haven't believed the message. The message that God gave you. So faith is complete protection from, from the devil's ammo. Okay? So he said, you take the helmet of salvation, the knowledge that you're saved through Jesus, but then he says, you've got an offensive weapon that I want you to use. Start wielding the Word of God towards these principalities and powers. Okay? So this is what we're told to do. Wield the Word of God against these principalities and powers. Because that's what he said that we're at war with, wasn't it? He didn't say wield the Word of God against your, against your, your fellow man. It's the principalities and powers that he wanted you to wield it against. And so, he says, finally, your second offensive weapon, praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit and watching thereunto with perseverance and supplication of the saints. Pray for yourself and pray for your brother that's under trial as well. Next slide. About that sword. You know, in Psalms 130, he says it perfectly. He says, I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. And thy word I hope. So he's saying that he is waiting while hoping in the record. Whatever the scriptures have said. That's where he has placed his hope. So he says, my soul waits for the Lord by hoping in his word. We claim those things he has spoken as if they were spoken to us and we're the only ones on the planet. I'm telling you, that's what a living word is. I have not always understood that, but I know that that is true today. It is a living word. And whatever he has spoken, he's spoken to all of us. So in uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse, chapter 4, verse 12, God's word is a living, living and active. And so it didn't die once it was spoken to somebody through a prophet or to a particular nation. It's still active and it's still true. The things that he said to Israel are true to you. And the things he said to David are true to you. Well, it, it does not matter because it is a living and active word. It did not die, it did not get to a place where it was spoken and then, and then just ran out of power after it was fulfilled in somebody's life. It, it, it's active to fulfill in everyone's life until the end of time. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts deep to the place where the soul and spirit meet and the place where joints and marrow meet. God's Word judges a person's thoughts and intentions and no creature can hide from God. Everything is uncovered and exposed for Him to see. We must answer to Him. And so this is what he's saying, that even as, as the Word of God is spoken, it gets into the heart where the soul and spirit meets. It exposes all the darkness that is in there and gives that person something to deal with, to cry out to the Lord to help him overcome. Or it will expose that he's in danger of judgment uh, uh, or something to that effect. But it is also a force against, as we are studying today, it's a force against those demonic forces. Next slide. The word in our mouths. In Isaiah 49, you know, he spoke about it like this. He said, Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken ye people from, from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb, and from the bowels of my mother he hath made mention of my name. And so what, he, he just recognized the Lord had plans for his ministry before he was ever formed up in his mother's womb. He had made my mouth like a sharp sword, and the shadows of his hand he hid me and made me a polished shaft in his quiver hath he hid me. And so he, he just was, was appointed to be able to speak the words of God. And his words, he said, it was just like a sharp sword in his mouth. Next slide. Prepare go-to verses. Now this is, what I, this is your assignment. For whatever you're going through, you find those verses that speak to you, that are, that are near to your situation as they can possibly be. And let that be your go-to verses every time the enemy comes against you. In, I, in Psalms 56, he speaks of, uh, of uh, the Word being a place to go to whenever there's, uh, when there's oppression. And he says, 
Have pity on me, O God, because people are harassing me all day long. Warriors oppress me. And so he's, he's got these evil forces coming against him. He says, all day long my enemies spy on me. They harass me. There are so many fighting against me. He just feels overwhelmed by the forces coming against him. He says, even when I'm afraid, I still trust you. I praise the Word of God. I trust God. And so he turns to the Word, and he's not afraid. He trusts God, even though it doesn't look good. He says, I'm not afraid. What can mere flesh and blood do to me? All day long, my enemies twist my words. Their every thought is an evil plan against me. They attack and they hide. They watch my every step as they wait to take my life. He says, with the wrong they do, can they escape? So now he's starting to open up. God sees what they're doing. You think they're going to escape from God because of what they're doing? Oh God, angrily make the nations fall. You have kept a record of my wanderings and put my tears in your bottle. They are, all, they are already in your book. Next slide. He says, Then my enemies will retreat when I call to you. This I know. God is on my side. Now this is important. You've got to know that when people are doing evil that God is on your side. And he is just saying, I'm not afraid. I trust you. I know you're on my side. The Word gives us a testimony that God is on the side of those that are with him. He says, I praise the Word of God. So he is looking at the record to decide what he's going to believe and how come he's going to trust God. And he says, I praise the Word of the Lord. I trust God. I'm not afraid. All the same psalm. What can mortals do to me? You have rescued me. So, <clears throat> so we can see that his conclusion of the Psalms 56 is he gets rescued. You've rescued me from death. You have, you have kept my feet from stumbling so that I could walk in your presence and in the light of life. He was there and he did what he always does. He rescues us. Next slide. <clears throat> okay, God to right thinking. In Psalms 119, I think this is the last slide we have. He says, let your blessings reach me, O Lord. Save me as you promised. Now look what he's doing. He is looking at the word of the Lord. He has found promises to himself. He says, save me like you said you would do. I will have an answer to the one that insults me since I trust your word. So we got people that are actually accusing him of things. He said the day that he's going to be able to answer those insults, it's coming. Because he trusted in the word that the Lord would save him. He's going to be in a place to where the truth will come out. Do not take so much as a single word of truth from my mouth. So he's saying, look, I don't want to replace your word with garbage. Let your word be there and let the garbage be gone. So he is saying, don't take a single word that's from you away from my mouth. My hope, my hope is based on your regulations. Whatever you have said in your word, that's where I've placed my hope. I don't hope in nothing else. I will follow your teachings forever and ever. I will walk around freely because I sought out your guiding principles. He is saying, because I am seeking out your guiding principles on everything going on in my life, he said, I'll walk around safe, freely and safe. Okay? Because he's doing that. That's for everybody. That's not just for him. So finding the scriptures that fit your situation, speaking them aloud against the forces that come against you, claiming them as the power that is working on your behalf, and siding them against the evil one and his minions is learning to warfare the way angels fight it. Okay? Next slide. That's all I'm going to share with you, y'all. I'll turn it back over to the brother in charge.